The motion is this House would repeal the 22nd Amendment. And without further ado, our debaters from the House of Winston Churchill and the House of Margaret Thatcher. Can everyone hear me? My name is Elle, and I'm going to be your Prime Minister in today's debate round. If all of the judges are ready. Well, in his politics, Aristotle discusses six forms of government, six true forms and six perverse ones. The true forms he calls monarchy, aristocracy, and a polity. The perverse forms, tyranny, oligarchy, democracy. Yes, democracy. Now, what separates a perverse rule from a just one. Well, according to Aristotle, it was one thing, the end to which the ruler or the number of rulers ruled. If, if the rulers ruled for their own purposes and their own good, they were called a perverse ruler. But if they ruled with an eye towards the common good, they were called just rulers. It is precisely because Audrey and I believe that we as Americans ought to shift our gaze to the quality of our rulers and not how long they lead us, that we believe that we ought to repeal the 22nd Amendment, or put specifically, this House would repeal the 22nd Amendment. Now for the uninitiated, the 22nd Amendment was an amendment to the Constitution passed after FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, served as president for four terms. The 22nd Amendment states that the president shall only serve for a maximum of two four-year terms. That's eight years total for those of you who go to Kings and don't do math like me. <laughs> Today, I'd like to examine three things that warrant a repeal of the 22nd Amendment. I'd like to look at three things. First, checks matter more than time. Circumstances matter more than numbers. And quality matters more than length. So let's look at checks and balances, everyone's favorite topic here at King's. Now the Founding Fathers in, in, never intended to legally limit how long a president was able to hold office. But they obviously did intend to separate our powers. This is where they drew on thinkers such as Montesquieu and Polybius. Now the restraint of power was not found in how long a member of Congress or the president ruled or presided over the country. We don't like the word ruled here in the US, I realize that. It wasn't in how long they presided over the country, but instead in restraining their power in other measures. This happened with the checks of power that we, the balance of power that we see, of course, and the separation of powers between the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive office of the president. This also happened in decentralizing power and granting it to the states themselves. This was how the founding fathers decided, drawing on nations such as Britain, Rome, and Greece that one man would not hold all power, and that should he try to take all power, it would be his tyranny would be restrained. Now, if the, leader was, if the leader was effective and just, whether in America or in any other country, it holds that it's actually better to have him in office for a longer period of time. Otherwise, the, pas the passions of a democratic peoples might elect a new, more tyrannical ruler who could undo all the good that the previous leader had done. This was why the Founding Fathers did not immediately implement term limits. But there, but there are still checks that remain, that did remain, and that will remain after a repeal of the 22nd Amendment for those leaders who do become tyrannical. These checks of power include impeachment from Congress, which can happen when a president becomes corrupt or is not upholding the Constitution, and also in free elections. That's a unique feature of American governance that we still have today. It's not going to go away if we get rid of presidential term limits. Yes, sir. Do unjust leaders ever win at the ballot box? Well, Jonah, that's obviously a very subjective question. But if you look throughout American history, If you look in American history, there are leaders that I think both you and I would call unjust. We might disagree on who they are, but we can, we can definitely and definitively say that the American people have elected unjust leaders. And if a president is ruling unjustly, whether he's been ruling for four years or for 12, the American people can decide whether or not they want him in office. And as Americans, 
Oughtn't we believe that if the American people want to keep a leader in office for 16 years, shouldn't we listen to the voice of the people, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, not by arbitrary numbers? The second thing I would like to look at today is circumstances that matter more than time. Not at this time, I'm sorry. Now, obviously, George Washington did set a precedent by stepping down as president after four years. And yet, if we wanted to follow Washington's precedent, we would set term limits at one term of four years. We're not really following in Washington's footsteps. Now, despite this, most presidents have t did tend before the 22nd Amendment to only hold office once or twice and then to step down. This is a tradition that was followed until FDR was president, which was far into, which, which is far into America's history. And so tradition shows, and America is a traditional nation, its presidents bound by order and, and the collected wisdom of the past. The presidents after the repeal of the 22nd Amendment would likely choose to give up power. And yet, think of exceptional circumstances that require a measure that allows presidents to remain in office longer than eight years. This is why FDR took on four different terms, so that he could lead us out of the Great Depression and through World War II, because he realized that a new leader might undo the reforms he had implemented and set America back to ground zero. If the United States engages in a war with the Islamic State, with Russia, or with any other world power in the future, we want and we need a president who can bring us through that conflict effectively. And that can't happen if you have two different presidents with two conflicting options of how to get us out. Now, the third thing I'd like to look at today is the quality that matters more than length. Now, the American tradition is based on a long and rich history of regimes and rulers who held that it wasn't how long a ruler ruled, but the extent to which he ruled that mattered. Think of leaders like Eliz Queen Elizabeth I, Alfred the... I hear you, my Kiwi ones. Alfred the Great, Henry V, effective and just leaders who ruled for extended amounts of time, and yet they ruled well. They led their countries effectively, and we remember them as being amongst history's greatest leaders. But it's the 22nd Amendment that shifts our gaze as Americans from how well a ruler is leading us or how well a president is leading us to how long he's been in office for. And we assume that as long as a president is not violating the 22nd Amendment, he must be doing his constitutional duties. This could not be further from the truth, and we do ourselves a disservice as Americans and as the Western world by having the 22nd Amendment in place. Thanks. In this great republic of ours, while we may have democratic impulses, we recognize that we are a government of laws and not of men. And that is why Grace and I are very proud to oppose this motion. The, th the problem with the side opposition, and this I'm going to get into this a bit more later, is that they only chose to look at a world where we have good leaders running for office. Grace and I want to engage with both scenarios. Why, when you have bad leaders, that's a reason why we should keep the Second Amendment, and why even in the case where we have just leaders, we should also have the 22nd Amendment. So with that in mind, I'm going to go into some rebuttal, and then I'll present our overall points. So uh, first off, we hear this point talking about why the Founding Fathers never intended for term limits. Uh, three responses against this. First is not in writing, sure, but in practice they certainly did. We've never seen an example of the Founding Fathers running for a third term in office. Why? Because they understood that power corrupted once they stood, uh, stood in power too long, that the America had to be more than just the ideas of one leader. Secondly, we also see history and circumstances have changed. The office of the presidency is dramatically bigger than it ever was when this was first created. So that's why we have to limit someone staying in power for too long. And third of all, actually Washington ran for office for two terms, not one term, so I don't know what that was about. Let's look at the next thing though. They then talk about the idea that if we have term limits, that that's subverting the will of the people, and that we should listen to the people's voice because that's how we know whether or not they're just or unjust, if the people say so. Here's a couple problems with that. First of which is, I think it's a very simple, sometimes the people are wrong. And it's interesting, it's interesting that uh, we hear about Aristotle, 
Because Aristotle, perhaps better than any other Greek political philosopher, talked about the very reason why he should curtail the power of the people and why democracy was a bad form of government, because the people can make bad decisions and we need to restrain them. Uh, we need to restrain the people in some cases, not at this time. So here's, uh, so, uh, here's the thing. We want to like, avoid the mistakes of where the people are sovereign, where the voice of the people is the voice of God. We don't want a democracy like the one we saw in the French Revolution. That's why there are many things we don't vote on. Like, we do not vote on Supreme Court justices. It's not because we're not a democracy, it's because we realize that people would be ill-suited for voting on that. Just in the same way, not this time, that people would not be well-suited uh, well for voting on a president who's been in office for many years. I'll talk about a bit more why that's true later. Then they give the example of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But before I go on, go ahead, Audrey. Mr. Jonah, you're perfectly comfortable with the people electing a president for one term or for two terms. But in exceptional circumstances, why not continue to allow voice to people for a third? What's the difference between two? I, I, I love talking about the exceptional circumstances. Now, here's the, th now here's the thing. With these exceptional circum uh, circumstances, like the example Franklin and Delano Roosevelt they presented. Now, I know all of you think that I want a world where FDR can run for as many terms as possible. I get that. But listen, here's the thing. The, when it gets right down to it, a time of crisis, an exceptional circumstance, is the very time we want to curtail leaders from being in office too long. Why? Because that is the time when tyrannies rise. That is the time when government power increases. That's why the government increased more under FDR than any other president before him. So let's, uh, beyond, finally, they talk about great, leader, uh, great leaders uh, staying in office, one of them staying in uh, office as long as possible. They give the example of QE1. Now, I love the girls of QE1, but but I don't think any of the girls in QE1 love Bloody Mary, who is also a bad leader, is in office for a long time. So, can, so let's go into our positive points of material. We think there's two burdens that we need to prove to win this round. First of all, repealing the 22nd Amendment, whether or not it'll actually help the country's interests in the long term. Second of all, does this abide by our Republican, uh, by our Republican principles? So let's go, uh, go to some points under that. The first of which is we believe repealing the 22nd Amendment leads to a one-party state. Why? Government says, well, you'll have elections. The people will remain in power. But here, uh, we'll rank to keep uh, power in check. But here's the thing. It's hard to break party dominance when the president and can run for a third term. Why? So our system has balance. After eight years, typically another party takes over unless you have a very exceptional candidate because of voter fatigue. But what happens uh, when you have presidents running for a third term? Well, if they run for a third term, typically they're very popular. That's what they got in that position in the first place to be even be able to run for a third term. But at this point, they control their party because they've been in office for so long. They can end any nomination challenges the way FDR uh, did in 1944. They control the party. They already have a fundraising network. They have the donors. They have the Senate in their their pocket. They can use the office of the presidency the way FDR did to posture and help us political campaign by making foreign policy decisions like keeping us out of the war until 1941 or to uh, win the election, uh, election. So here's the, uh, the, so it's very likely they will win. Now why is that bad? Well, we think that regardless if you like the leader or not, it's bad because it ends up shutting the other party out. The same way that FDR's dominance got people so used to the Democratic Party with the exception of Eisenhower who's sort of exceptional because he was a military commander and very popular, the Democrats dominate from 1930 to 1968 because people got so used to FDR being in power. Why is this bad? Well, you end up getting less moderate policies. We see too much of a sway in one political direction because one party is in office for so long. Now, if these are bad radical policies, we think this is bad in of itself. But here's the thing. You might say, well, what if it's a good leader? Well, remember this. The leader might not be one whose policies you agree with. They may be just as much as they may be good policies. They could be radical policies. But regardless of what, uh, what party it is, we think the country's better off when you have moderation when we go back and forth and we settle on a mean that have just policies to include all people. Why do we want that? Well, look at the alternative. Look what happened with India for like 50 years where the National Congress Party controlled their government and they shut out any political opposition because the, they were in office for so long they could stack the courts, they could stack the political system. No other voices can enter the conversation. People who opposed the National Congress Party were viewed as less uh, uh, Indian, less true to their uh, government, less true to their national identity. Their voices were uh, de legitimized. And I think regardless of party affiliation, we want every voice to be able to be heard in this conversation and no party to be shut out. 
Let's look at the second point, though. Is that leaders are more likely to corrupt, even if they're good leaders. So let's ignore the fact that there are plenty of bad leaders out there, say like Andrew Jackson or whatever, who do very bad things if they were, uh, ran for many terms. But let's talk about the good leaders, though. We think that the, the good leaders, they're more likely to become corrupt over time. Why? Because they get so used to being empowered, they get used to getting their, uh, their way. It gets to the point that they're beyond issuing executive orders, that they exert control over, the, uh, over uh, their government, they shut out uh, opposition, and they cut corners in order to accomplish their agenda. We saw this in FDR's fourth term, violating civil uh, li liberties, having a multi uh, the more executive orders in that term than in any other, and shutting out political opposition. It be uh, it be the president, uh, America ceases to become a America of two parties and become that one president's America. Let's look at the final point, though. The final point is this turns America into a nation embodied by one man or one woman. And the thing is, is here, here's, the, here's the thing. I know the presidency is the most visible office. I know our focus will usually be on the presidency. But our founders created a country where we didn't want uh, our entire hopes and dreams in this government to be staked on one person's ambitions. We knew this because if that president died, it became a lot harder for the country to move on collectively. But beyond that, though, we knew we were a nation first committed to principles, to laws, and not just to one person's ambition. This great country of ours is bigger than one person's ego. That, as, uh, that it must have room for every voice. That it must have room for political opposition. On their side of the house, you might have a good leader be able to run for another term. But as we've seen with FDR, I think they're more likely to become corrupt if the longer they serve in office. But what they don't account for, what they have not told you, is beyond how does this stop the corruption and how do they uh, stop the exclusion of political voices. They didn't engage with the hard part of the case. What happens when the leader isn't so good? That's why I'm very proud to oppose. Jonah asked you, what happens when the leader isn't good and we don't have term limits? Well, my question for you is, what happens when the leader is corrupt and there are term limits? The same situation occurs. Clinton was impeached. People voted people out of office after a first term because they were bad. We believe in the laws of America and in the power of our political system to still serve to check bad presidents. But at the end of the day, we believe that the 22nd Amendment is an arbitrary restriction which simply prevents qualified statesmen from serving their country, which is especially damaging in the most chaotic of times when the country is most vulnerable. So we'll go on and we'll have this conversation about what happens if a president is bad. But in the vast majority of situations, the only thing that the 22nd Amendment does is it prevents qualified, wonderful presidents from continuing to serve their country in its time of need. Now, let's jump into Jonah's arguments here and start off with this question kind of about a one-party state. Now, the first thing I'd like to note here is that in a situation without term limits, we can look to history and see what happened when there weren't term limits before FDR. There were multiple parties. In fact, there were more parties than there are now. We had the Whigs, we had the Democratic Liberals, we had the Republicans. Like, there were a lot of options, even though there weren't term limits. So this isn't a hypothetical question anymore. We can literally look to history, look what happened when there weren't term limits, and conclude with certainty that it has been empirically demonstrated that without term limits, there are still multiple parties, there's still democratic discourse, there's still opposition, and the democratic process that occurs without harm. <clears throat> But secondly, uh, under this argument, Jonah also suggested that the single party will be able to hold control. But I would submit to you that we would have already seen that uh, if, this, if this argument were the case. So one thing that's important to notice here is we're talking about America, we're talking about free elections. We're talking about a situation where throughout history, with termlets and without, we have seen presidents peacefully pass power to their successor, regardless of what party they originate from. Now, when we look, let's just look at one example. Let's talk about Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, after his two terms, after his two terms, there was still another Republican who was elected. So in a situation with term limits, we still saw that party, because they had done a great job with a great president, elect the subsequent leader. So I would suggest to you that it's not, it's not necessarily the fault of term limits. That doesn't control whether or not we see one party continue to dominate the discourse. What does control whether we see a succession of presidents from the same party is not term limits. It's whether or not the president does a good job. Um, and at the end of the day, I would say in that situation under President Reagan, we probably would have been better off with three terms of President Reagan than two terms of President Reagan and Bush. Now, the third thing I'd like to note here under this argument is, you know, we think it'd be great if we saw Reagan for a third term, but what happens if we get FDR for a third or a fourth term? What happens then? We all agree that he was corrupt and he probably shouldn't have continued to be in office. 
Well, the American people agreed. They voted him out of office, even though there weren't term limits. That's the point here. <laughs> um, not right now. Okay, so the second point here is about just like bad press. Now let's move on to the second just suggestion that apart from the control of a single party, just what if there's a bad president? Well, I think I've already answered this with this argument about FDR. Their free elections still occur. People can still vote that president out of office. But secondly, corruption still occurs within term limits. That's just the fact of the matter. When we elect a president, we're putting faith in a leader. We're allowing them to be the face of America. That is true regardless of term limits or not. But we think that at the point where you're electing a leader, you're putting your faith in them, and we're allowing the people to choose again in four years, we should allow the people that choice. If we can trust them to elect a president now, we should allow them to elect a president in eight years or in 12 years. Um, and then finally, Yes, it's an inevitable that in some situations we might get a bad president, but it does go both ways. We're accepting the loss of great leaders if we're willing to continue to allow the Second Amendment to be in place. This repeal of the, the, the term limits here, it wouldn't work in a corrupt society, in a society that didn't have free elections, that didn't have other checks and balance, that didn't have an educated populace. But at the end of the day, when we're talking about America and we look to history and we looked at what happened before we had term limits, we can clearly conclude that it's not going to lead to some kind of dictatorship. That's an extreme example, and that's not going to happen when we have checks and balances, we have impeachment, we have these other democratic political processes. Now, shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about the Founding Fathers and about the circumstances which have changed, because we do believe that they have changed. Yes, the Founding Fathers, in practice, they generally, you know, limited themselves to one or two terms. But first of all, they did that without term limits, and I think that would probably generally continue. But secondly, I think we should allow that option, that option to run for a third or fourth term if the circumstances demand it. I'll give you some examples. ISIS, Russian aggression. We've seen situations in the modern world, just with the threat of nuclear weapons, where the stakes or higher. The Founding Fathers didn't have that. They maybe didn't need it as much. But the fact of the matter is we should preserve that option because in those exigent circumstances we might need a good leader, a Reagan, to step up and continue the stability of his leadership for a third term. We might need that and we'll regret it if we don't, uh, if we don't repeal the Second Am 22nd Amendment um, and allow for that option. So let's talk about that a little bit more. What does it look like to have, what is so good about having a president, a good president, continue their leadership in times of chaos? Well, first of all, they already have established connections. They already have established alliances. And that allows them to avoid gridlock and to preserve stability in a time of crisis. They also have established international relations. And the confidence that comes from those established relationships is key in a time of chaos. It's important to allow this option, to allow a president in a time of chaos when it's necessary, a good president, to allow the people to have the choice to elect them again. If people believe in the policies that that person has done for eight years, and they're looking at a situation where they say, wow, you know, we're facing international terror, we're facing foreign aggression, they've done a great job protecting us so far, and as we're on the brink of this war, it's important to allow that president to continue to do their work and continue those established relationships that already give us confidence that we're safe, the American people should have that right to choose to extend their presidency. And going along with this idea of just policy confidence and overall stability, the ultimate conclusion here is that it's up to the people. We believe in the right of the American people to choose their president. We believe in their right to choose them for four, for four years, for eight years. And me and Elle also believe that this is the same right that should apply for 12 years. At the end of the day, when we have these checks and balances, when we already have an established political system that punishes corruption through free elections, that punishes corruption through the impeachment process, and gives the voice of the people a right to be heard every four years, we believe that that process should be honored and should continue, especially when we're facing times of crisis and risk, and it is absolutely necessary to allow these great statesmen to continue to serve our country for a third term. Thank you. Can everybody hear me from up here? Okay. Hello, okay. There's a reason why Washington stepped down. There's a reason why we passed the 22nd Amendment in the first place. There's a reason why Aristotle was right. It's because when we remove these types of laws, when we remove these types of regulations, they offend the American principles and ideals that made this country so great and keep making this country so great. 
So with that in mind, my speech is going to be looking at mostly some points of rebuttal, going down with touching a little bit on what Elle said and then what Audrey just told you, beginning with this idea of a crisis. Supposedly, in an exceptional circumstances, when we're on the brink of war, when we're in a state of disorder, we need the same person to step up again. What they totally ignore is how does every dictator, almost every dictator in the history of the world, almost every authoritarian regime in the history of the, of the world, when do they come to power? They come to power in a state of crisis. So this is the very moment at which we need to hold to our principles the most. In a state of crisis, when we abandon principles, that's when the enemy has already won. We should not abandon this principle simply for the state of political convenience and simply for the state that you think you have better relationships. Now, the next response to this is, well, we're in a democracy. We're not going to have a tyranny or a dictator. Well, that might be the case. You still have all of the disadvantages with that leader once the crisis has been resolved. You have a national identity defined by a man and not by laws and political cohesion. And oftentimes, you have the same flawed policies being implemented because they're propped up by popular support that in a lot of cases is wrong. Crisis is the time to hold to our principles, not run from them. Then the next point they bring up is supposedly how we won't have this one-party system. And they say, well, just look at the empirics of the situation. It really hasn't happened. A couple of responses to that. First of all, the reason why we haven't seen this happen is because every president, almost every president, has followed this unspoken rule and stepped down after two terms. They have not chosen to run for three terms. So the empirics are mo not, most definitely not on your side. Let's look at the one situation when we did have a president that went for more than two terms. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who actually went for four terms. What did we see in the aftermath of that? We saw from 19 1932 to 1968 was a Democratic president without fail. What we saw was essentially a one-party system in the works where we had a continuation of Democratic ideals and a shunning of Republican ideals for tens of years. So one-party systems do tend to develop when you, have that, uh, when you have that popular support that comes from an incumbent president being elected again and again. So the empirics are there. Now why is that bad? And that's the analysis that Jonah gives you. That's why we have a discourse in this country. That's why we have a political party system in this country is to be inclusive of all voices. So when you have a candidate like FDR and when you have candidates who have popular support, they often have that support at the expense of minority voices and other views that might need to be heard. Now the next, this, this segues me into the next point of rebuttal. They say, well, we have presidents when they're elected, um, say Ronald Reagan or a, a, another president similar, where you have another Republican president or another, another Democrat president elected right after him. Well, here's the problem with that. When they elect someone from that party again, they're saying that we agree with their policies. When you continue to elect a man again, you're electing that same figurehead as not saying that you're electing those policies. What is, what is the impact of this? Jonah gives you the impact of this. That is when you have a national identity that's defined by a figurehead and it's not defined by what's best for the country and what's best for those interests. I'm glad they brought up the idea of an incumbent advantage. They talked about the relationships that individuals build and they talked about the relationships and they're just better and more experienced in the office. That's why people vote for the same person over and over again. You can look at the appearance of that. They don't vote for the person because they think they're a good leader because they have the best policies. They think they just have more political clout in Washington. That's a real thing that the, polit that the people do and that's where the people fall short and are wrong in electing the same leader over and over again. So even when you have a new leader from that same party, we say that brings a shift in attitude. It opens up the conversation again because you're not just using the popular support from this guy who's been elected for two terms in a row. And in addition, you don't have that power entrenchment. You don't have the idea of power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. Sure. Great. Doesn't the process of having an election every four year, a free election, open up the conversation again? If we trust the people to have that decision every four years, why wouldn't we trust them to have it again for potentially 12 years? Yeah, that's a good point. I would love to have as optimistic a view of American elections as you, but that's simply not the case. When you have a candidate that just has and I think the popularity of Donald Trump can speak to that. When you have a candidate... When you have a candidate that just has such overwhelming popular support, it doesn't matter what the debate says, it what's the, what does the American people says in that instance. The conversation is largely skewed by the popularity of a two-term president and you don't actually have that free conversation. We think even if you have a same candidate from the same party, not having that figurehead allows the discourse to continue and have a better conversation and national interests that are better for the American people going forward.
Now, the next point I want to talk about here is why, uh, really addressing this larger issue here, of why a great leader should not be allowed to continue to lead beyond two terms. The first point here is the idea of what is the attitude that they take. Now, I agree we're not talking about an idea of democracy here or a tyranny. We do have checks and balances in this country. But what is the attitude of that leader, even when they're a great leader, when they've been in power for one term, two terms, three terms, four terms in the case of the FDR, and potentially five or six on their side of the house, what is the attitude of that leader. What we see in the precedent is that they're willing to cut corners. They get entrenched that they have the support of the people behind them. They think, okay, my policies are best, so it's okay to ignore some of the steps and checks and balances. We see this often with FDR and his super, well, a lot of really sketchy policies that he just kind of tried to get smashed through the Supreme Court, and a lot of those had effect for a short period of time. You have a lot of policies that were kind of sketchy when it came to civil liberties. So although it might not be the question of a dictator versus a democracy, the attitude of a candidate has Having that same person in power for four, five, six, potentially seven terms, that's bad and it leads to bad practices and precedents on the office. We want a country where we elect a president, not just a figurehead. We want, a, we want the, pres the office of the presidency to lead our country, not just one man. And that's what Washington said. He wasn't just worried about the fact that you might have a king like over in England. He was worried about the fact that it was going to become the United States of George Washington, and that's not what he wanted. The next overall, overarching argument I want to uh, hit home today is supposedly that the will of the people is always right and that the democracy, that we should just trust the will of the people to elect another leader. First of all, I think Jonah's very right that Aristotle has some poignant notes on this, but this is where our democracy meets a republic. This is the, this is the battleground of a republic versus democracy. We recognize the dangers where an individual can grow so much popular support, where an individual can get a movement behind the country and he might not be the best candidate and we check that power. The whole point of populist, you, look, you can look at populist movements uh, throughout history of the United States and how the people get caught up in a populist movement. They don't have the best interests in mind. In addition, we have two distinct factors of elections that make it so how the people are often misled with popular presidents. The first of all, simply just voter turnout and participation. Less than half of the country even turns out to vote on this day. In addition, you have the idea of what I talked about a little bit earlier, the idea of an incumbency advantage, that oftentimes people aren't, and you see this especially on state and local elections where you don't have term limits, people just vote for the candidate because they think he's more experienced, they buy into argumentation that you can't be a good president if you haven't met the ambassadors from other countries, you can't have good foreign policy simply because you haven't met them yet. They buy into that narrative and they simply elect him based off of experience but not on a precedent of good policy. We would reject that narrative and we would have this free discourse happen again in our country. If you agree with Washington, if you agree with why we passed the 22nd Amendment, if you agree with Aristotle, I think you should vote side opposition, and that is why we are very proud to oppose. Thank you. I'm thirsty, whatever. In their attempt to prove that this will actually achieve both burdens of bettering the national interest and of abiding by our Republican principles, the government team need to do a few things. They need to explain to you why this would not shut out opposition and create a one-party state. They really didn't engage with that. They needed to explain to you why uh, this will work both with good leaders and with bad leaders. Grace and I explained why this will not work with good leaders or with bad leaders. They talked about good leaders, I think they even failed there, but they didn't even address what happens with bad leaders, which is why I think we should win this debate round. What I'm going to do is go over two main questions. The first question is, will this serve the national, uh, national interest? The second question, does this abide by Republican principles? So under the first question, the government team suggested that, look, we're only going to be having leaders who have good and popular policies getting reelected. I think the answer is definitely no for the reasons Grace and I talked about. First of all, that when you're voting for the same party but a different candidate, that's how you can tell if they're voting for popular policies. But when they're voting for the same leader for a third term, all you can tell is that leader is able to consolidate power, control the political system, and that people like him as a personality. That does not mean they necessarily like him as, uh, for his policies. 
Secondly, though, secondly, this is important. They ignored how this drives out political op uh, opposition. We see that uh, how Democrats were in power for two generations because the country got so used to Democrats controlling the, uh, controlling, uh, the White House. Yeah, so what ends up happening when we have one party in power for so long? We get less moderate policies and more radical policies, and you shut out opposition. I brought up an example of India, an example they never touched on, how when you had one party in control of the country for 40 years, political opposition ceased to exist for that country for all intents and purposes on a national level. So what ended up happening? People who had different views were shut out. Their views were less legitimate. If you disagreed with the president, uh, you, uh, you were uh, uh, less of a citizen. You were less patri uh, patriotic. We think that our country is at our best when you have an opposition party very often taking over after those eight years. A country where we are all Democrats and we are all Federalists. A country uh, where we have factions to check the ambitions of the two parties and to balance out our political system rather than having one party's agenda for, uh, for eight years because even if you boys and Le Reagan love Ronald Reagan let's face it it might not be Reagan for eight years it might be Obama for 14 and uh, not 14 16 right that, so you just got uh, got to bear in mind it could be someone you disagree with the third point under this is dealing with a time of crisis now uh, now as Grayson said that in a time of crisis we can't just rely on one person we have to rely on the fact that other leaders will step up and they ignored the fact this was a very important point that in times of crisis is the very time when we need new leaders the most rather than one leader because that's the time that le tyranny rises and that government consolidates power. You saw, saw that empirically when FDR consolidated power uh, after uh, being in office for so long. Government says that we can uh, avoid this by restricting the system, through, uh, by restricting these leaders through checks and balances. But two things on this. First of all, they ignore that these, this 22nd Amendment is one of those checks and balances, and they're getting rid of it. The second point under this is that uh, what ends up happening is they ignore our analysis that when leaders are in power for so long, they consolidate control so they can overcome those checks and balances. They pack the courts, they redistrict, they get people used to being one party in power so it gets to a point that no party can enter an opposition, just like we saw in India for 40 years. Government says, well, some, uh, some of these problems might be true of someone in office just for one term. And sure, they might be right, this, some of these problems might be uh, true for just someone in one term, but that does not change the fact that they exacerbate those same exact problems on their side of the house. Just because those problems might be true to some extent with Grayson and I, Cesario, does not uh, change the fact that we explained how they're exponentially worse on their side of the house. That does not deal with their analysis. So even in their best case scenario, when it's not a bad leader, it's still, uh, you're still having a situation where opposition is driven out. You're still having a situation where you don't have political moderation. We address the best case scenario of why this is bad with a good leader even in office. They never explain to you why it's bad with a bad leader in office. Let's go to the second question. Does this abide by Republican principles? Now, they say that this is giving the people a, vo a voice, but here's the problem with that. The problem with that, first of all, is often you're just, this isn't a really reflection of the people's voice on policy, just the popularity of the president in power, their use of him being in power, and he has undue advantages over controlling the office for eight years. Second of all, people are often wrong. Uh, we saw that Aristotle, their own source they've been talking about, uh, agrees with us that people's whims must be limited. Now, why do we see this the case? They claim that we want to support, uh, we want to support the people's voice. I won't be able to take your point. Uh, we won't be, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we want to support the people's voice, but here's the thing. The thing, uh, the thing is, there are plenty of things we don't give the people a voice on. We don't elect judges. We don't elect cabinet posts. Uh, constitutional amendments, they're not by popular arenda, uh, a referendum. Why? Because people are often wrong. So if the government, it's not enough for the government to come up here and say, give people a voice. They need to show you why they need a voice on this specific issue. They did not also explain how a one-party state is compatible with our Republican systems. They did not explain why the office of the presidency should be about one per, uh, person rather than our country should be about broader principles. I mean, here's the thing. The world of the government team, and we've taken them at their best case, but let's be real here for a moment. The world of the government team is a world where Caesar did not cross the Rubicon where Napoleon did not go into the French council chambers and become emperor, where Hitler did not seize the Reichstag. The world of the government team is idealistic and it's optimistic and I admire that. But we know that our laws do not exist for people being angels. We know our laws exist because men are not angels. That they must be limited. That we must check ambition with counter ambition. Check one party with another party. That's how you balance our system. That's how you protect our laws. You don't get that on their side of the house. You don't get a republic. You get a government of men and not of laws. And that is why I am very proud to oppose. Thank you. Yeah!
Well, unfortunately, I can't begin this speech with a lot of fireworks as Jonah just ended his. And unfortunately, it's also very clear that I don't know how long George Washington was in office. But here are th three things that I do know. America is a nation of laws. America is a nation of democratic institutions. And America is a nation of statesmen. Or at least, she was created to be. We believe that these are three things that will still exist after a repeal of the 22nd Amendment, and indeed three things the 22nd Amendment undermines. And it is for these reasons that we would urge you to repeal the 22nd Amendment so that there are no longer term limits on how long a president might serve in office. I'd like to go ahead and look at how we are a nation of laws. Now the president was meant to serve under the law, not just members of Congress, and the, just as members of, the, of Congress and the judicial branch are as well. And if the president violates the laws, it's the duty of Congress to impeach them. This seems to be something that the opposition has forgotten in today's round. Jonah can talk about Caesar all he wants, and he can talk about India all he wants, but ty tyranny doesn't happen when people elect a leader three times. Margaret Thatcher ran for office three times. Tyranny happens when the law of the land is violated, and as, law, and as long as the United States Constitution exists, we will not see tyranny. And that's on Congress to impeach the president. It's not the president's job to only serve for eight years. It's Congress's job and the people of the United States' job to hold them accountable. The Constitution and the separation of powers still exist when you repeal the 22nd Amendment. Something else that we need to realize is that the president actually holds very little power. That's not going to change under a, under, a, under a ballot for the government either. Now I know this seems as a shock, I know this seems like a shock to us, but the president isn't going to just go and start signing legislation or offering judicial verdicts if you vote for the government side. The president will still only sign bills passed by Congress and use the power of the bully pulpit to inspire the American people or strike fear into their hearts as clearly Jonah just did now. Those are the types of things that the president will still be able to do. The president will still be restrained by the law and checked by the brilliant separation of powers that the Founding Fathers intended. The Founding Fathers had in mind that we would check and restrain power through our system and not through some arbitrary number of how long a man can be in office for. Now, the second thing I'd like to talk about is that we are a nation of democratic institutions. Now within the Constitution's boundaries, we the American people have the freedom to experiment. Now Lyndon Baines Johnson uh, talked about how we as Americans have the most fundamental right of all to choose our own leaders. Sometimes when we choose our leaders, the right man in our minds will win, and sometimes the right man will lose. There's always going to be Reagan supporters who hate Obama and Obama supporters who hate Reagan. But if we are going to take Abraham Lincoln's words of the Lyceum seriously, that America was a test and an experiment to prove to the world once and for all that a free people have the capability to govern themselves, then we need to trust the American people. If we're going to believe in our principle, then we need to live that out. I'd also like to point out that the voice of the people hasn't proven to be so wrong after all. After all, presidents only did serve in office for a maximum of eight years before FDR. Also, the opposition would have you believe that FDR created this terrible un system where there was only one party and no opposition. And yet it was the American people, without the 22nd Amendment, who chose to vote FDR, or excuse me, who chose to vote Harry S. Truman out of office after, uh, after FDR. People still, <clears throat> so even without term limits, people still voted for the people that they didn't see as the best or not the best. Now why don't, why are we not giving the people the voice that they deserve? The voice that our founding fathers believe they ought to have. Like Polybius advocated for all the way back in Rome, there's a separation of powers. The government has the power to pass laws, to hand down judicial verdicts, and to lead the nation. But the people have the right to choose their own leaders. Now in the Lyceum Address, Abraham Lincoln also encouraged us, we the people, to be on the lookout for a tyrannical and ambitious leader who would usurp power until he held it all absolutely. Now it's difficult, it's more difficult to hold a leader accountable when we say, meh, he'll be gone in eight years. I would hold that the 22nd Amendment has actually encouraged us to care less about actively encouraging our leaders to pursue just policy and less about participating in policy making and more about who will be president next. It would appear that the 22nd Amendment has made us lazy. It's made us a nation obsessed with elections and not with policy. 
But we're, suppo we're supposed to be a nation that participates. We're supposed to be a nation that cares. We're supposed to be a nation that can even have a voice to oppose whomever is in power. This is also something that the opposition seems to be forgetting. There has never been an example in American history, no matter what happened in, in Indian history, when opposition was driven out from discourse. When FDR was president, her, President Herbert Hoover, former president at that time, was writing books about the dangers of FDR's policy that would later go on to inspire Bill Buckley, Ronald Reagan, and the conservative revolution of the 1980s. Even under President Obama's policies, there's clearly an opposition. Love or hate Donald Trump, he has animated the enthusiasm of a huge segment of the population. You, the, the opposition can't point to a time, a single time in American history, when we've seen this hyperbolic one-party system or one-party world. And I would urge you to stand in reality with the government and not in hyperbole with the opposition. <laughs> Finally, we are a nation of states. Finally, we are a nation of statesmen. Now, whether, whether we have an absolute monarchy, which, by the way, is what Aristotle originally advocated for, or whether we, have a con whether we have a constitutional republic, or whether we have a president or a democracy, there are always going to be good rulers and there are always going to be bad rulers. The four of us could sit up here all day and talk about good monarchs and bad monarchs, good presidents and bad presidents. We might disagree on who they are, but Good people are going to rule sometimes, and bad people are going to rule sometimes. That's completely non-unique to whether or not we have the 22nd Amendment. But here's what changes. Without the 22nd Amendment, a good leader in power at a time of crisis is not able to effectively lead the nation. There was obviously a lot of fear-mongering going on on the side of the opposition. And yet, nobody would argue that President Obama and Donald Trump have the same strategy for defeating the Islamic State. And if, hypothetically, we were to engage in a war with the Islamic State or another group like that, and the president changed and their strategy changed, that would throw us into chaos and into turmoil. And it's in times of chaos and turmoil that, that we see the Caesars of the world coming. So I would urge you to stand with Aristotle and with the government and repeal the 22nd Amendment. Thanks.